Hello everyone, I'm Terry Modishead. I'm the Executive Director of the Centre for Legal Innovation at the College of Law. And I, I just couldn't be happier or more thrilled to bring this new law career series to you. We want to, over the course of particularly this year and perhaps the year afterwards, focus on the careers, the emerging careers and the emerging options and opportunities in law. And we couldn't think of any better place to start in a couple of different ways. Firstly, with Molly Tregellis, who you're going to meet uh, more and hear a lot from today as Everyone. well. Uh, and secondly, um, also to start with legal ops. And, and I'm sure as Molly will attest to this as we go through these three episodes, this is the first of three, um, just how amazing the growth in that career has been. Uh, and also I'm sure she'll be sharing some little bits and pieces along the way of her own journey in that career as well. So if you don't know much about Legal Ops, this is going to be the series and the episodes for you. If you've just started in that career or if you're experienced, this will also be the series for you. So we're going to basically touch on pretty much the A to Z um, of Legal Ops over these uh, three episodes. So do for sure listen to this one, but don't forget also to tune in for episode two and three, and I'll remind you about that as well at the end. So with all of that being said, um, again, Molly Tregellis, who is the Director of Legal Optimization Consulting at Minter Allison, yes. uh, thank you so much for being our lead collaborator uh, on these Hello. episodes, and you are most welcome. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thrilled to be here with you for the first of three sessions, as Terry mentioned. Conscious that there's a really broad audience, I think, here. So there'll be people from private practice, people from in-house, uh, people in the Australian context and elsewhere, and then students and a whole range of different people. So I've sort of tried to bring a mix of everything in and hopefully there's something for everyone in here. I'm talk a little bit about the theory or the sort of basis of um, legal ops and then my experience and some of my own views on what's really important. So lovely to be here with you. So what are we covering today? I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the def definitions out there of legal operations. There's quite a few and then I've got my own very basic version I'd like to share from my experiences. Why is it important and what we've seen in terms of the growth of the industry um, in the last few years? the Legal Operations Toolkit, and I'll share a few examples of that sort of depending on the scale you're working with and also share some of the industry focused tools that are out there. And then just some examples of the value legal operations can provide and why it's really important in the current legal environment. And a couple of case studies, which are sort of a mix of real life with some hypothetical inf um, sort of examples in there to show in simple terms, some of the work that a legal operations professional might be doing and why it's really valuable. So just to start off with a little bit about me and why I'm here talking to you about this topic today. So I started life as a lawyer, I was a litigation lawyer, and then uh, moved into legal project management, which I really loved. It kind of clicked for me that I liked working within the legal context, but not directly as a lawyer, really suited the way my brain works. And from there, I became a head of legal operations at Minter Ellison, um, and more recently ha have a built I am building out a practice in legal optimization consulting, which is legal operations services for in-house legal teams. So it's been a really awesome career that's obviously still going. And I'm very big on sort of selling legal ops as a career option to people coming through because it just, if you speak to people in this industry, they'll say, you know, I feel like I've come across this secret, like that this is this really awesome job that's out there. So hopefully I'll give a bit of a flavor of that today. Um, so I did a BA and I've got a Juris Doctor as well. And then I've got a range of certifications that have been really, really helpful as I went along um, my path. And I think sort of helped me go from step to step. When I think about my key drivers in terms of what, you know, pushes me forward and fulfills me and gets me up in the morning, it's all people and relationships based first and foremost, which is why I love the job I do. All about problem solving. I love, you know, at home, at work, driving everyone nuts, solving their problems for them. Really focused on empathy. So sitting, you know, in the design thinking context, but more broadly sitting in the shoes of the people you're trying to solve problems for. 
uh, strategic thinking and then cutting through the noise and hopefully you get a bit of a sense of that today. There's a lot of noise out there in this industry and more broadly, but I think, you know, you can distill a lot of these down to quite simple concepts and principles. So I'm going to run through a couple of definitions of legal ops and for some people this will be, you know, they'll know this well and truly, but just to give a sense of you know, what some of the industry bodies would say. So the Co Corporate Legal Operations Consortium, um, which is, you know, the, the key organisation and thought leader in legal operations globally, um, has this definition, which is about a business processes, activities and the professionals around it that enable legal departments to serve their clients more effectively by applying a business and technical practices to the delivery of legal services. There's also the Association of Corporate Counsel. This is obviously very much focused on an in-house perspective, but not too dissimilar in terms of looking at the activities around optimising legal services. So that same focus around taking business concepts, processes, and in this case, mentioning data and technology to, to help the way that um, the function practices law. This is sort of the def definition that we use internally at Minterellison when we're talking about servicing our internal teams. And it's all about that connection of best practice, process, people and technology for a range of benefits. And I think from our perspective, certainly when I was ahead of legal ops, and I know there's a few of my colleagues on this call, um, that process, people and technology trifecta is the thing that we're all really focused on driving forward and, and teaching lawyers about. And then I thought, well, look, if I want to, you know, cut through the noise, as I say, I like to do what is um, a really simple kind of way of defining what we do. Again, really interested in people's views. This might be too simplistic, so interested to be challenged on this. But, you know, when I think about it, it's really giving time and space back to lawyers so they can perform at their best. So this is a way I think about it. And I love this picture, which I often use. And thinking about the lawyers who genuinely are just so busy um, and, and are just churning along, trying to get everything on their plate done. And I like to think of this man with their, his round wheels as the legal operations person suggesting a new solution. But what's missing in this context is the fact that the person with the round wheels needs to come along and get these guys to stop, take a breath and realise that there's a better solution out there. So in my mind, that's what legal operations is all about. Just another definitional note, I think, you know, there's obviously a clear profession and industry and language around legal operations, but what we see and the people I talk to is that there's sort of a skill set and services, which I'll talk about a little bit, that really are probably delivered under a whole range of banners. So, you know, sometimes what we would call a legal technology lead is doing this work, legal transformation lead, innovation lead, someone that's managing projects is actually doing a whole lot of these tools, you know, in the legal context. We often see these amazing legal assistants that are actually working really as legal ops managers because of the way that they're trying to improve the processes they work within. And of course, um, other roles such as knowledge managers, which often find themselves doing something much broader than, you know, like black letter knowledge management. So there, there, in terms of the career piece, there's a whole range of options that sort of still fall within this legal operations banner. So going to um, why is legal ops important and apologies that that, that middle um, picture might be a little bit blurry, but it's more just for the, the sort of the impact rather than the detail in it. A lot of people might have heard or seen this concept of the T-shaped lawyer. So on the left is the what's you know considered the, the traditional lawyer that are really good at the, the traditional legal work and their legal knowledge. <clears throat> there's a lot of discussion in the industry around the fact that there's now a real need for lawyers to have this T-shaped set of skills. They can't simply you know do the law well anymore. From everything I've seen from my time being a lawyer being married to a barrister, working in law firms my whole working life, is that really for lawyers, the things that are concerning them and keeping them up at night are these, some combination of these four factors. So the time that they have or don't have to do things um, and how long things are taking and how much time they have left, how, how much things are costing in a law firm context that relates as well, of course, to you know the costs of the client and how the client um, taking or the work that they're doing and appreciating it. Performance, you know, their personal performance of a lawyer, are they considered to be good at their job by their peers? Are they performing well for their clients? And risk, the whole job's about uh, minimising risk. So with that in mind, that's a lot on their plate already. In my mind, I think 
that some of these other skills, it's kind of challenging to ask a lawyer with all that going on to take on these other elements of the T-shaped lawyer. So in my mind, that's where the legal operations professionals come in to elevate what the lawyer is doing and support them through this other sort of non-traditional skill set. Another example of why it's important, we ran a think tank recently about why do legal tech projects fail with our fabulous, our internal digital team. And just running through some of the things that came up that is like just ongoing consistent challenges. The one is the significant lack of time that um, the legal subject matter experts have to give to providing the input needed. So one of the things the legal operations professional can do is try and coordinate that input in a really efficient way to save time and ensure just getting the least amount of time for the most impact for those lawyers. Another key challenge in the legal tech context is around the solution actually not being fit for purpose. And that often comes because there hasn't been a really rigorous pre-assessment done. So that's something that a legal operations professional can support or do. And then process review, you know, going back to that concept of the people, process and technology, we say people and process always comes first. So being the one driving a process review forward to ensure that when the technology solution comes along, it's the right one and it's working in the right way. No implementation plan. So we run some surveys of in-house teams. One of the key challenges is still technology. And to add to that, one of the challenges they, they see is they feel this underutilized potential in the technology that they already have in their stack. And often that's because when they get a new piece of technology, there's no focused implementation plan or program. So the technology sort of dropped in and away they go. And that leads to this problem where they've got something potentially really valuable that no one's using um, very well and they still feel that they've got all these technology challenges. Legal ops people can come in uh, and develop that plan and lead implementation because they know the team, they know the lawyers and they're supporting them through the change. Uh, another challenge that we talk about it, you know, in legal tech is a lack of leadership from the top or, or a lack of um, sponsorship from those key stakeholders. So when we think about legal operations, we're thinking about people who are leading and influencing at that level, at the senior level, and supporting those leaders to really understand what's, what's required and why they need to be on board. Challenging change environment. I mean, you know, I think legal is a very challenging change environment something I have a lot of discussions about and do a lot of thinking about. But what we do see when legal ops has done well is this, this kind of like incremental change by stealth that can occur. So leveraging the fact that these are trusted people with embedded within these legal teams who also really understand the pressures of the legal team they're working with to kind of help influence change in that stealthy way. And then, you know, the other big challenge often is that it's a technology first project going back to my comment about people or process first, what legal ops can do is take that step back and provide an objective perspective and say, you know, look, this is actually more about the way people are working together or we need to look at this process first before we jump to technology. And finally, just in terms of, you know, why is legal operations important and increasingly so, I think there's this, you know, really critical uh, set of influence and factors that are going on at the moment in the legal industry that it having what I call a change explosion. So for people working as lawyers, there's just this, it's a really challenging environment for a number of reasons. So there's sort of the ongoing eternal capacity challenges that anyone we ever speak to says, we simply don't have enough people to do all the work required of us. Then this new flavor of the great resignation and the fact that when we're talking to in-house teams in particular about helping them at the moment it's shifting from being all about efficiency to retention like how do we ensure our people don't leave what do we need to do technology massive you know legal tech market a lot of noise a lot of exciting things going on but navigating all that can be really challenging the businesses that people are working in or servicing are changing very rapidly i mean the last few years you know unrecognizable levels of change and the risk and regulatory landscape, you know, the Royal Commissions that have occurred, et cetera, in the Australian context have really changed the way that businesses operate. The eternal refrain of doing more with less, still an eternal challenge. The workload is not decreasing. The expectations are increasing. So there's this big lot of factors that mean 
more than ever, that lawyers need support to do they work, the work they do and to navigate all these challenges. And that's something that legal ops professionals are sort of there to do and support. Just a little bit on the growth of legal ops. Um, this first graph is from the Association of Corporate Counsel's benchmark, benchmarking report. It's the Chief Legal Operations, uh, Chief Legal Officers report that comes out each year. And what we can see is that from 2015 to now, you know, it was at 21% um, of departments surveyed had at least one legal ops professional. Now it's looking more like 60, 60%, I mean, a slight drop from 2021, probably a lot of factors relating to COVID, et cetera, that might have, that might be influencing that. It's really interesting to see in that, in that period of time, you know, there is a significant increase in the recognition of the importance of legal ops professionals. And then on the on the right, just you know, this is from the Corporate Legal Operations Consortium, just the flow of, of where we're at and you know, in this present state down the bottom around, you know, trying to establish a culture of continuous improvement. So so rather than accepting status quo in a legal department, um, this idea of constantly changing the way that you're working, improving things is is a massive theme and something we see across the board. And then, of course, the technology piece, so use of automation, uh, external legal service providers in this context, but, you know, technology more broadly to help with efficiency um, to lower costs. And I would say improve employee experience and engagement is now another critical factor. So that's sort of where we're at in terms of the growth. <clears throat> in the Australian market, for those of you um, that are in Australia, Certainly a few years behind the US and UK in some senses. So what we see in the US is that big corporates, it, it's sort of almost accepted and broadly recognised that big organisations have a legal ops individual and most of the time a team now. They, they, they're definitely embedded as a critical part of the legal team. Whereas here, there's still, you know, that, there's still growth there. And in the UK in particular, law firms, um, you know, are, are probably a, certainly a few years ahead in terms of having legal operations functions. But certainly in the last five years, there's been a really significant growth in the Australian market in terms of recognition. I mean, speaking to Terry before this session, had we run this five years ago, everyone would have probably been like, who, what, like, what is this thing? But now obviously it's clear from the numbers today that there's a lot of recognition about what it is. We're certainly seeing in the larger corporates that teams are being built and consolidated. You know, the financial sector in Australia certainly have teams. And what we're also seeing is um, the increase or the start of panel arrangements in some cases for legal ops services, which is an interesting um, next layer on all of this. In the um, you know, mid-size starting to get some recognition that you don't have to be a really huge team for this to be valuable. And, you know, as we say, there's, you know, with the capacity resourcing issues being just chronic and technology always being a challenge, you know, there's a recognition that smaller teams really also, um, there's a need for legal ops resources. In the law firm context, it's very strong activity at the moment. Um, you know, if you look on LinkedIn, there's a quite a number of legal operations roles and at leadership level as well, including in some firms where they don't currently have a function that they bring someone in to build that out. There's also uh, a rise in legal ops grad programs in the last few years. Minters likes to think we had the first in the Australian market. And I think some of our grads, um, say Remy, hello, are on this call today. So we're very proud of our own grads. I think for anyone that's looking um, at grad programs, our applications, I think, will be advertising on the 14th of March for anyone interested in that. But um, we can, there'll be details on LinkedIn around all that. So obviously a lot of change in the last five years. I think um, a lot of uptick in people understanding the concept. And now it's looking at how is that being translated both in law firms and in in-house environments. And also the education available for people that are interested in this area of work. Moving on to talking a little bit about the toolkit. So starting to think about, well, what does it, what does it mean? Like, what are you working in if you're a legal operations professional? I've got a couple of examples of toolkits. This one sort of pulled from something we use at Minter Ellison in terms of um, training our grads on legal operations, but also talking to clients about what are the, some of the factors. So, excuse me, running through this very quickly, you know, a lot of the work we do internally, and we see that the key part of legal ops toolkits particularly in law firms, 
is the continuous improvement project. So for example, using a Lean Six Sigma or a similar process review approach to really look at where there's opportunities um, to reduce inefficiencies, enhance automation, leverage technology, or shift the way that work's done. Legal project management's another big piece of that. So um, certainly in some law firms, uh, you've seen huge uptick in uh, hiring of legal project management resources and threshold any matter above a certain level is required to have one. And it really just supports that kind of strategic like project mindset for matters so that things are maintained in a similar way you would another type of project. The costs are managed, all the milestones, the teams are all managed in a really structured way. Legal tech, I mean, that's a big, huge bucket, big challenges, as I said, but a lot of excitement in that space in terms of the potential um, and something that legal ops teams are spending a lot of time understanding, working in, getting their head around supporting teams and clients with. Another big one, workflow automation. Um, we're seeing certainly in law firm context and in clients a really strong interest in this area and in automation more broadly in terms of how can we really connect up all our processes. So we've got these end-to-end -end solutions that are working really hard for us and reducing the kind of man hours involved. And that goes to, for document automation, which is obviously a key element there. Um, but you know what we incorporate in, in legal ops is knowledge and precedent really can be a really challenging area in the sense that like getting a good knowledge strategy up and running and really getting precedence in order is actually more challenging than it sounds, but actually creates a lot of efficiencies and improve in the way people work and reduces risk because there's not inconsistency between the way team members are doing particular things. Process review, as I mentioned, AI, big, exciting, um, Thing on the horizon, you know, there's, I could have a whole other session on AI and we've got some great people looking into it. Navigating that is, is really interesting because it's exciting, but also the, the practical challenges um, in implementation. Big thing on strategy and stakeholder management. And I think one of the quotes I've got later from an in-house head of legal ops goes directly to how critical that piece is. In the in-house context, a lot of uh, vendor management, law firms, client management. So working out improved processes around actual engagement of clients. And then two, you know, these are more broad, but just coming up with smart ways to do things. And I said, as I said, you know, throughout this, having that space to step back and look and think, hmm, I think there's a better way we can be doing this. And then being a provider of educational training or, um, you know, access particular training that would be valuable for the team. Um, I won't go through these in detail, but just for those that aren't aware, there are the, the clocks, so the um, clock that I've been talking about have a maturity model as do the C, which I'll show on the next slide. And this is their way of saying, more focused on in-house teams, how are you going with your legal operations in each of these areas? So if a legal operations person is working in an in-house environment and is looking for a, like a, a framework, this is one that, people look at and talk about about if you're doing all this really well your legal ops um, service and your practice is running really well. Similarly the ACCC has got a maturity model it's, it's similar mostly to the clock one in terms of you know these are the areas of focus um, that you know you need to be proficient in to run well so there's an expectation that in-house legal ops teams that are following this maturity model understand and know what needs to happen in each of these areas for that particular team. But what I was thinking about as well is, you know, for a lot of people, um, it may be that there's not this huge sort of access to resources, or it might be one person in either a small firm or small in-house team who, you know, all they have is themselves and what, what they can do. So what I wanted to talk about is some of the kind of key tools, like, um, tools and skills that a legal ops professional can hold and what the benefits um, that they bring. And this is without, you know, really having any access to automation technology, all those sort of those things that can be challenging in resource constrained environments. So the critical one, and this will keep coming up as a theme, is around the legal stakeholder management. This is just um, 
it can be really tricky. It, it, it's an art. The legal industry and legal um, lawyers are, I, can, I suppose I can say this, being an ex-lawyer, a funny beast, you know. So um, engaging with them re requires a particular way and understanding and, and a lot of empathy for just how busy and challenging uh, their work is. So what it would look like to be good at that is really engaging in a lot of discussions with a particular legal team, understanding their challenges and knowing when they need support or when they need someone to come and, and really question the way they're doing things. And what does this do? What is the benefit? Well, it sort of provides legal team access with a trusted advisor who's got that space and step back and they're able to look at challenges a bit differently, more holistically and think of solutions knowing the context in which the team operates. In terms of that strategic and commercial mindset piece, really important. One of the things, you know, when we look at in-house teams, it is, can be a challenge sometimes is really aligning themselves with the broader organisation needs. Sometimes there's feedback, you know, this, this team's a black box or they don't understand our needs. It's never the case. It's more actually just articulating, you know, often in a reporting sense, all the work that the team's doing and how it does align with the needs of the organisation. So having someone with an eye on all that, understanding how to talk to that, what reporting would, would um, be valuable and getting that running is really useful and important. And then challenging the status quo. So, you know, asking, is there a better way we could be doing this? And, and having that space to look back just means, you know, things don't keep happening because that's the way they've always happened and really enhances opportunities for efficiency and improves service delivery. Next one around being a translator. So, you know, I, I'm not um, super tech literate. I know enough to know who to ask and what they're talking about. Uh, and I think that's important, but I don't think you necessarily need to be able to code or run doc auto yourself, you just need to be able to understand the language because really what an important part of this role is, is talking to the, the lawyers in lawyer language and being able to translate to the tech team who are very tech focused. And it means that when there are these sort of legal team needs that are identified and articulated, they can, you know, they can be passed on to the technical team in a meaningful way. And it means you're more likely to have a solution that actually works for the team that needs it. And then a big, big one around trust and, and strong relationships. So, you know, in the in-house context, like really being a trusted advisor to the GC. And we say that um, when we're talking to in-house teams about getting someone in, in oh, as a legal ops professional, we say, you want someone that is senior and strategic and is sitting alongside you supporting your decisions. And that is critical. Also, I think we've seen it work beautifully in the law firm context, our head of legal ops at Minters uh, have direct dotted line to the, the managing partners. And that is a critical piece of the success of the program. Just a few others, um, maybe more sort of personal ones, but knowing where to access the right tool. So again, not having to um, do doc auto or understand the ins and outs of every technology, but just knowing where, where to look or where to, who to ask juggling many balls at once, like it's just one of those jobs I find where there's always many, many things going on. Anyone on the call who works in this profession, I'm sure would be nodding wholeheartedly with me when I say that. Need that sort of um, an inherent organisational skill set, good at managing projects. You know, people ask sometimes, do I need project management training? I say no, it can be handy just for the concept, but it's just, are you one of those people that likes to have everything nice organized running smoothly great and then another big one and this is interesting we sometimes when we see people that have come laterally so they've been lawyers and come straight to legal ops there's a challenging point or a development point around stepping back from the doing and leading because I think a trap for legal ops professionals is getting caught up in smaller projects and trying to deliver to enhance the reputation of the team and it means that not some of that big work doesn't get done. So one of the, the key pieces I, I'd say for professionals is to kind of be able to step back, know when they need to just get in and do, and or when they need to be leading others to do the doing. And then, I mean, of course, this last one's a bit tongue in cheek, but I do kind of believe it, like super empathetic, all seeing future visioning wizard. Just, you know, never forgetting that 
Um, we are all here to support the lawyers. If I ever hear anyone in legal ops land like speaking disparagingly about how, oh, a lawyer didn't understand, I just like, hang on. Like, if we're not here in service to these lawyers, why are we here? Why, like, why are we here? So that I think is important as well. So if people have the question of like, what do legal ops projects look like? You know, it literally can be all over the spectrum. A small, seemingly silly example, but not that silly um, real life one is teaching, you know, a lawyer coming towards the end of their career um, about to retire, how to use control F. I know that sounds mad, but this person was not gonna use a new system. But, you know, in terms of teaching them this shortcut, suddenly they, they've created all these efficiencies in the way they're looking for things. So sometimes it can be that tiny, like a tiny shift, understanding the context of what that person needs and where they're at, just giving them a little tool to do things better. Other end of the spectrum, managing agile transformation of a legal department, you know, this is an in-house example, um, you know, huge project. We're talking about every element, uh, getting teams together, changing structures, responding to business needs, etc. Whole range of things in the middle as well. So, you know, um, implementing workflow solutions is a big one. You could do quick win continuous improvement projects, which might look small or big, implementing technology. So I suppose, you know, rather than going through a whole range of projects, the, the point of saying this is just that there's just a, such a gamut, uh, a breadth of types of projects that legal ops teams work on. Talking about a day in the life, um, I asked my crew internally, uh, what are some examples of what, you know, you do in a, in a usual day busy? Uh, I jokingly said to them, it's just basically meetings all day, right? And everyone's like, yeah, like there's a lot of meetings. <laughs> but to flesh out what those meetings are for, it might be meetings about new technology, um, meeting with the legal teams about a particular solution and the benefits or you know, that grey bubble meeting with senior stakeholders to manage expectations around the cost of delivering a particular solution. A lot of expectation management, I would say. Running awareness sessions to help lawyers understand how digital solutions work. So that goes into that training and education piece I mentioned earlier. Uh, discussion with team leaders. So talking to actual internal teams around operating models. How do you keep delivering solutions without teams just growing and growing and growing, which is obviously an ongoing challenge. Uh, meeting with vendors. So there is a lot of a sense of, you know, being that gate for, mark, for market scanning. So if a vendor comes knocking that they've got the, the solution that's gonna solve everything, the team will be the ones that review, <clears throat> to provide feedback. And then if we wanna procure, they will work through issues and negotiate agreements. Big project meetings, so going back to that skill around project management um, to help make decisions, work through what's changed, what needs to shift going forward. Working with teams to mentor, coach, share learning. So that's more that sort of team piece. And then, you know, in the context of the teams I spoke to, they've got big teams underneath them. So actually just the people element of all this work. I also asked a head of legal ops at a law um, in-house team to share just a bit of thought, his thoughts on a day in the life. This is what he said, you know, the best part is that there's no such thing as a standard day. It's all different, which I would completely agree with. And then, you know, this real need to stay flexible and constantly triage and prioritise. And here's this point, you know, I was raising earlier, the stakeholder engagement and management is the key. Many lawyers struggle with going to, from being on the front line. So I think he's talking here about, you know, some of the challenges of shifting to in-house and that, you know, the, the, the role of a lawyer in an in-house team is as a cost center and the challenges associated there. So these ideas of educating around efficiency and doing more with less are kind of the critical pieces of a legal ops offering. What I wanted to do, um, I've got four case studies um, just to flesh out a little bit of uh, what legal ops might look like in particular contexts. 
please feel free to shoot any questions about anything I've covered. I've got these four case studies and then um, left some time for questions at the end. So very happy to, to talk through anything I've covered. And I've done two law firm examples and two in-house examples. In terms of a smaller law firm, just one of the challenges uh, they may be facing that legal ops could support is around high write-off levels. So where, you know, they're, ch they're billing, sorry, their time spent on a matter is more than they're able to charge and they have to write off the remainder because they can't charge the client. This obviously has a significant impact on law firm profitability and particularly in a smaller firm, you know, like large write-offs can have a really big impact. It also points potentially to challenges in the way that matter's being run and whether it is actually being run efficiently with the right team and also points to challenges around managing the matter to the agreed fee estimate. Um, so what are some of the things that legal ops could support with and what we would suggest in this example? So in the first piece, this scenario points to a need for legal project management and either having direct legal project manager support for so someone actually supporting matters um, or in, including increased training around legal project management and tools. So, you know, that might be things like smarter cost estimate, fee trackers, uh, different types of reports that show the status of the matter, scope documents that keep uh, tracking scope against reality, etc. Some of it can be quite simple, but it's just the maintenance of it throughout a matter when things get busy uh, that, you know, can need some sort of professional eyes on it. In terms of the pricing, the next one's pricing training. So the other question is, has the, um, the fees been estimated properly? You know, if there's a big write-off, maybe the pricing wasn't right in the first place. So supporting either through their own experience or bringing in an SME to do some of that pricing training for the team. And then another one is even just um, support training um, information around the strategy and communication with clients, because sometimes it can be simply just having the tricky conversation with a client and saying, we actually the scope changed from X to Y, um, and this is the value you got from this bit of extra money, we're gonna charge you 50% of it. Um, and that way maybe the full write-off amount doesn't need to occur. The value, obviously ideally you're reducing write-offs and the pressure on the legal team, hopefully enhancing client satisfaction because the clients are feeling like there's real transparency. They know where fees are at, they know where there's scope changes, etc. And of course, uh, hopefully firm profitability. So what this sort of does, and you could imagine as a business case, if a lot small law firm's wanting to get a legal operator professional, you could do some maths on the write-off levels. Let's say you reduce it by 10%, you're probably paying for that person's salary for a year. Uh, large in-house team, this is the next one, no matter management system. So we, this is so, so common when we talk to in-house teams, we are really, you know, still amazed how, how common it is that there's no matter management system in place. And by matter management system, we mean anything that supports the matter life cycle from instructions coming in, being allocated, tracked, uh, closed. Uh, what this often, the challenges this provides is often that there's a real lack of data within the legal team around who's doing what, how much value it's adding, how strategically important it is. There's no ability to have capacity oversight. So, you know, we've talk, been talking about the real resourcing crunch, like this critical challenge around having too much work and not enough people. And it's a refrain we hear often but if you dig into the data, often the legal team has not enough data to prove this, that it's anecdotal. They know that the teams are stretched, but they can't say, look, you know, X has done 50 matters over the last two weeks. That's 20 more than this time last year. And it also means there's no transparency over workflow. So if you've got a GC with any size of team and they, you know, they, they couldn't say, I know that lawyer X has 20 matters on their plate, but lawyer Y only has 10 of X size. You know, this is how I'm gonna manage my team. So um, legal ops, what it does, what it could it do here? So support assessment of matter management solutions, because there's some really fantastic ones in the market. 
um, and some Australian homegrown Australian ones that are really great. But I suppose, you know, for each legal team, there's going to be different needs that need to be factored into those decisions. Building a business case, because what we see is there's often a lack of um, direct technology bu budget for the legal team. So a business case needs to be built. Someone with that strategic mindset and oversight of the team is well placed to do that. And then, you know, being that conduit to the um, in-house IT team translates for them and for the legal team about getting the process underway and then also supporting and leading implementation. Um, this really solves uh, the challenge we spoke about earlier around underutilised potential in technology because of the lack of implementation. And so, for example, we've spoken to the legal ops manager at a large financial institution recently, recently and her whole role for 12 months was a massive legal team, so huge change management, was rolling out a matter management system from the, going through all these stages of assessment to change management. It's a massive job for a big team, um, but really a critical one. What is, value does this provide? Increased efficiency, fit for purpose solution, so making sure the solution actually works for the team. And then that real focus on implementation, because the legal tech providers often provide some support, but it's not that critical kind of like change management ongoing support that you might need. Um, and then there's enhanced data capacity oversight and transparency. So the challenges I spoke about up front, the, they're solved by running uh, good data for a system for a while and being able to leverage that for reporting. So then another one, which, you know, no doubt is super common because big law firms are large places with lots of people in them, there's going to be some inefficient processes around the place. So, you know, what does this mean? It means that um, fee earners are wasting valuable time, um, either they could be billing or that they could be just living their life. Um, and it can lead to real significant engagement challenges and team frustration because people just feel like they're working endlessly for not much to show for it. Of course, client dissatisfaction, because if they're on the receiving end of inefficiency, fees might be higher or the work product might not be as good. And also can lead to write-offs because if things are inefficient along the way, you know, you might be billing more than you can you know, charge out having to write off. So what can legal ops do for this? This is where this awesome process review, for example, Lean Six Sigma methodology process review can come in get people to come in and literally review the process from end to end. And through that, pull out a whole lot of um, improvement opportunities, which may look like new technology, document automation, aligning precedents, getting the team to do things in a particular way, re uh, increasing the level at, at which something's done. So if it, it should be done by a more senior or a ju more junior resource, just as a few examples. The, the other side benefit we see with this work is you get the team, the legal team in a room for a day, it's a big commitment to review their process. And it's almost like this cathartic therapy session for them all because they go, oh my God, first of all, look how much work we're doing. No wonder we feel busy. Secondly, I didn't realize you do it that way. I do it this way. Wow, okay, we're doing things differently. Let's talk about it. So I've never seen one of these that hasn't been just so valuable just from a personal level for the legal team. And then the value here is of course increased, increased efficiency. That's what the whole point of it is. And then, um, you know, identifying improvement opportunities. For example, as I said, automation, updated precedents or adjustment of resourcing levels. Final example here. Um, so let's say you've got a small in-house legal team that doesn't really know where to begin with uh, wanting to be smarter in the way they're working, having limited resources. Often this kind of legal team is not gonna be able to have a full you know, head count, senior head count for legal ops, but want, they know that there's sort of better ways they could be working. So some of the things here is to find, you know, the smart person in the team or the savvy person that's got this kind of brain and give them some upskilling um, or carve out, you know, 50% of their role for this for a particular project. And then, you know, developing some really light touch quick win plans. So not quite the teaching a partner how to use control F, but 
a few quick things like, you know, inbox um, shortcuts. Like there, there could be some things that just really enhance the way the team's working that are not big bang and can be done within the context of the team without needing money, extra resources, et cetera, and smart technology options. So, you know, there's amazing technology out there. And for example, in the Office 365 suite now, we're just seeing such amazing tools and a lot more focus on um, citizen developers, as they call them, being able to, if you've got some tech smart, build automation or build little programs that work for the team. So, you know, it's an exciting time for those that have got this drive to kind of improve and do things better. What's the value here? Well, you've got, you know, a legal team that's running better, you know, working smarter and also strong engagement. Because if you're giving people that are interested in this area the opportunity to do some projects in this area, then they feel supported in their own interests. And ideally, I suppose, of course, the internal client satisfaction is there because, you know, the, the corporate internal clients can see that the team is trying to be efficient and responding um, to the needs and demands of the business. That is broadly um, my presentation. I would love some questions, Terry. I'm not sure if there's any around that I can cover. I'm happy to cover off anything that's come up if there's anything. Absolutely, we do have a couple of questions. I'm going to get you, Molly, just to advance us to the next slide because it would be great yes. for folks to be able to see your contact details because I know you're open to them reaching out to you Absolutely. after this session as well. So it'll just give them a chance to jot that down. And of course, um, they'll be available with the uh, video and podcast recordings as well. Um, so folks, do please direct your questions to the q and I, I just wanted to... Um, to, to get your thoughts on a couple of takeaways that I had, Molly, as I was yep. listening um, to your presentation. It, it, it really is very clear now that legal ops has emerged, not emerging, but has actually emerged as a specialist function within the legal ecosystem. Because as you said, it's, it's not just in-house, that's where it might've started, but it's very much like yourself uh, in law firms well and truly yep. now as well. But the other thing that really struck me as you were going through the depth and breadth of what you cover in this. Firstly, a little bit exhausted looking at all of that. <laughs> but, but secondly, that it, it is now really lending itself to a career path because there you really can segment that out to kind of a foundational intermediate and advanced level. And I, I wanted to throw that out as well. If folks that are watching this are kind of thinking that uh, and thinking where to start on this journey and, and work it through as well. So um, thoughts or comments on that, why I just bring up uh, these questions yeah. and, and... Yeah, and, and I should say, you know, like I obviously whipped through what I called um, what's under a legal ops toolkit, but you're absolutely right. In, in our structure, in a law firm that has the ability to have a large legal ops function, we have people dedicated to being those stakeholder engagement roles, our head of legal ops, but we also have this big technical team, so legal service operations team, which are the technical experts in Lean Six Sigma, in legal project management, in legal technology. So in terms of those career path pieces, not only is there the, the in-house sort of all doing all, seeing all wizard type role, there's all these really interesting um, technical roles that are, they're hard to find people in those areas. So there's certainly um, areas of opportunity as well. And a shortage of talent in a number of those areas, yep. as you said earlier. So real opportunities there. So I've got a, got a couple of questions um, with the in-house lens on. So I'm going to pose yep. them with, with looking through uh, looking through that. And I know that you, you've you touched on some of these, but it may be just kind of reinforcing a couple of points that you've made. So yep. the first one is, what's your number one piece of advice for someone who's building out a legal ops function? Yeah. Top, top priority, I guess. Yeah. And, and yeah. I know we're going to cover that a lot in episode two as well, but yeah. just thoughts on that initially here. Yeah, exciting time. And I think um, the quick answer is when we talk to in-house teams, we look at this wheel that I've got up and what we'd say is work out what the, the critical priorities are. It's often that strategic alignment piece, but getting a short plan roadmap together that shows what you want to get done um, import, really important. It can be super high level and, and small wins. The other piece I think uh, quickly is baselining. So trying to run a survey 
understanding what data you do or don't have, getting a picture of now, because what you want to be able to do in six months, 12 months is report success. And to do that, you need to get a picture, you know, in all these areas we've got up, where are you at in these areas? Where are your gaps? Where are the challenges? So that you can measure success and improvement. And value, I guess, ultimately. And exactly, the yeah. value of your role. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, just staying in-house again for a second and again on the prioritisation um, yep. front, if you could only invest in one area and assuming that you've got limited resources, budget, you know, have to show value, et cetera, yep. where would you invest? Um, I'm going to assume for a moment that the team is running fairly well. So I'm going to put aside culture, which can be its own bucket. I think process. So every a lot of things hinge off process. Um, and so that's really looking at what processes do we have? Can we review them and make them better? Because out of that falls the answers of what technology you may or may not have and what data you're missing. And it also supports understanding resource constraints. So in terms of a practical focus area, if you want to get going with some, some work, some review work and some change, it's looking at processes and starting to understand the inefficiencies there because that will build your roadmap, technology, pipeline, resource needs. So true. I mean, like it's almost like the number one disaster, isn't it? That you buy your technology, mm -hmm. um, which seeks to entrench a bad process without looking oh, yeah. at your process first. You That's know, right. uh, yeah. So staying in house, um, mm -hmm. another another quick question here and related. How do you build the business case for legal optimization in a small in house council team? Yes. Yeah, yeah, good question. And I think, look, it will in some ways depend on the levers that you can pull, and that will be different for every organisation. But I think in any case and with any of these buckets, there's a way to um, be smart to convert it into often a dollar or a headcount focus. So if you've got an organisation that's very headcount heavy, you can do some maths to say, okay, just as a very broad example, We've got a team of four lawyers. We estimate that at the moment, 40% of their time is on admin. Mm -hmm. If we reduce that to 20%, you can see how that, that would flow. So, and that's kind of a live example we have at the moment. We've looked at a team and um, done some work and 48% of the legal team overall is admin, they're, they're weak. So you can imagine, you reduce that for all of them a little bit. So I think it's working out those levers and working out how you can um, sell it back either by if they want headcount, static headcount, that's what it is. If it's greater um, service delivery, it's enhanced um, services for the client or the end client. Another big lever is reducing risk um, mm. in the in-house context. This is all about risk. And one of the discussions we often have is that if the in-house team aren't considering risk in the right way due to inefficiencies, whatever it might be, that can actually hamper the uh, forward momentum of the whole organisation because they're seen as risk adverse, blockers, can't get contracts through. So sometimes risk is the lever that you can use for that business case. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully that's helpful. Whoever that person is, very happy to chat more about that offline because it is a big, juicy topic. Absolutely. And a couple of um, smaller but juicier topics too yeah. kind of related to that as well. Yeah. Uh, the first one's in relation to pricing and, and it's yeah. kind of, you know, what gets tipped into legal ops in a way and what is outside? So the question is, do you regard pricing innovation, emphasis on innovation there, so, for example, moving from, you know, the billable hour to value-based pricing as a legal ops function? Interesting question. I really like it. I'm assuming we're talking in a law firm context. Uh, yeah. Look, I, um, I'm a big believer in trying to move to more innovative pricing personally. It, it depends on, you know, it, the weird answer is it probably depends on the structure of the firm. Some firms pricing is squarely within legal ops because in my mind, it's the other side of the legal project management coin. You've got pricing, which is setting a price You've got to be good at estimating and all these legal project management things, and then legal project management managing to a price. So I think, yes, it should absolutely be considered as part of it. Structurally, often it sits elsewhere just by the yeah. quirks of the business. But it's, it's, it's very relevant to all of this because you're talking about how to enhance service delivery to clients. So, yes. Yeah, I mean, in, in some way, shape or form, it's got to connect, right, I it guess does. is. Yeah, it absolutely. absolutely 
Yep. Uh, another kind of business case related question. Um, what KPIs do you think are most helpful for in-house legal teams? As Assuming that means legal ops. Yes. Yep. Uh, yes. I, I yep. would say so, yes. Yeah. Okay. So again, depending on the particular um, environment, um, the KPIs could be around efficiency. So reducing the time the lawyers are spending on low value, low risk tasks. And that's something you can, if you're smart about initial benchmarking, show. It could be that the KPI is successful implementation of a matter management system and uptake by 75% of the team, all things that can be tracked and measured. So it can be that, you know, or like uh, increasing the data um, access we have data to from one point to 25 points. It can be something like net promoter scores. So doing client listing of say the executive of the organization coming back in 12 months saying through the work legal ops will do, we aim to increase those scores by X percent. Um, just as an example, my KPI when I first started my role was make everyone love me. For six months, that was my <laughs> KPI, which goes back to the trust of relationships. And I think just, I know time's getting away from us, but one of the, Perhaps we sometimes see in the in-house context is people dive into wanting to fix things. So they're going into a legal team and going, you've got inefficient processes and I'm going to come in and fix things. But this person, no, people are like, who are you? So I do think if you can possibly sell to your the people you're working with that a critical KPI is somehow the trust placed in you by key stakeholders, without that, the rest does fall over. So I think if you can kind of upwardly influenced to have that as a key linchpin of your strategy early on. It's really important. I know we're almost at time, but I'm going to try and squeeze in a couple more sure, questions. I'll give so, quick answers. So, no, you're right. <laughs> so bear with me. So I'm going to combine um, two of them together yep. because they kind of they kind of fit together. Um, and that is, you know, how do you get the lawyers excited about this? How do you get buy-in from them? A and then, you know, it's, it's just so closely connected. Once you do, how do you keep the momentum going? Yeah, 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 super hard, so challenging. I think on the first, um, it's really tapping right into the actual, actual problem behind the six problems they've told you is the problem. And that's a lot of discussion and investigation. So they might say the technology is stuffed, zoom right out, teams having some dysfunction, no one's using it properly. You know, the problem can be something else. In terms of momentum, I think it's small, very incremental steps, almost stealth uh, um, change, all about that. So they almost don't know it's happening till it's happened, yeah. which is a bit counterintuitive to change management, but I just feel with lawyers, big bang doesn't work. Yeah, e evolution, right? Uh, yeah. Um, so just gonna, going to kind of take us into the community legal centre land for a second, yeah. um, and that is, you know, what are your thoughts on the importance of legal ops in the CLC sector? Mm. And because obviously these are folks who are often under-resourced and yeah, they're, yeah. you know, challenged because there's huge demand. It's it's kind of like a, a difficult um, yeah. two-sided coin there, I guess. So would you recommend in those circumstances starting with a light touch or quick wins or or something else? Yeah, I, I love that. And I love that idea of, of support for CLCs, absolutely. And I think that light touch is probably right because um, they're already resource constrained. So putting big projects on top without the investment in resources is gonna be super challenging. But that continuous improvement mindset in terms of taking a step back and looking at, we could just adjust a few things to make life easier. Even that could be really um, exciting to see the changes. Yeah, absolutely. And one final quick question. Yeah. Okay, I lied. I said it would be two, but it's been three, right? Um, but it, it's it's come up a couple of times. Want to start on legal operations career? Excited yep. about it? You know, yep. we've got them excited. All people excited about it now, Molly. Yep. Um, where do you start? What's your yep. first step? First step: um, keep an eye out for grad programs. Uh, there's a lot floating around. As I said, ours is coming up in mid March. Uh, applications open. Otherwise, I think it's getting hooked in. There's a real, and Terry, as you will know, 
really tight little industry and tight in the positive sense, as in supportive, open, information sharing, low ego industry. So the best thing I think you can do is tap into that LinkedIn, look at Terry's resources, Centre of Legal Innovation resources, follow people that inspire you, which is what I started doing, understanding the language, and you will see jobs come up through that way. And, and I think finally just, and we'll, I can talk about this a lot more in the next session, which is all about it, but look for sideways opportunities. You might start um, with a really strange sounding kind of entryway into legal, something to do with project coordination or managing something, and you can kind of navigate your path up. But getting the legal context is critical. So however you're doing that is not wasted time, even if it's not exactly what you want from the very beginning. Yeah, it's kind of, it, 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 it's, you don't have to be a lawyer, but you have to understand the industry that yeah, you're going exactly. into, in, right? And, and in any way, any kind of in-house or law firm, like getting a foot in the door, you work out the landscape, you start to understand the stakeholders, the rest can build from there. Fantastic. Um, Molly, fantastic session. Um, really, really enjoyed it. Um, folks, do reach out to Molly. You can see her contact details here. You'll also see them in the recordings of this. It will be available as a video and a podcast, so you can watch or listen or do both, as the case may be. For up-to-date info, don't forget to follow us at the Centre for Legal Innovation on LinkedIn, Facebook or Twitter. You'll also find Molly on LinkedIn at the very least, yep. if not in a gazillion other different places. So do again, be sure to reach out to her. I do want to remind you about episode two and three, because we've mentioned mm. them a couple of times. This is, you know, from the center's point of view and the new law series, these three episodes, this, the month of March is basically legal operations month. We love so it. <laughs> we do. So episode two is on, do I need a legal ops professional? And that's come up a lot. There's been a lot of questions about that so you may find that particularly useful on the 17th of March um, and episode three is going to really dig into those challenges and opportunities of the legal, legal ops function and we've got a an international panel that will join Molly there as well and you'll you'll see that one coming up on the 29th of March so with all of that said um, fantastic Molly thank you again thank you great to be it was lovely I loved it and if you want to keep the again. absolute, well, you will be. And am, if, yeah. <laughs> if you want to keep the uh, the conversations going, I'd also just mention the Centre's Legalpreneurs Lab that has a special interest group on innovation and legal ops, and membership of the lab is free. So you'll find that um, also on our website. So Molly, thanks again, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us from all around the world. Really look forward to seeing you back for episode number two. Thanks again. Bye. Bye.